So, so day two has come to a close. Well, day two is kind of, there's an event on day two that kind of blends into day three. And that was what I wanted to start with. It's kind oh. of, it kind of, you know, overlaps both day two and the beginning of day three. And that would be the Battle of Culp's Hill, which was, if you look at the uh, famous fish hook, uh, uh, analogy that they use is would be the top of the fish hook mm. and uh what happened basically was at night or basically dusk uh sun on, going down the sun going down on july 2nd uh, um lee had wanted general yule to conduct a um a feint if you will to draw off federal forces while Longstreet was doing his attack in the South. Longstreet's Confederate. Right. Yeah. Yep. So if you remember, Longstreet's attack started, you know, sometime around four ish, and Ewell's attack started sometime around 7 38. Almost all of day two is in the afternoon. Right. So the problem with that is if you're going to do a feint, you generally want to do it either simultaneously or before <laughs> the attack that you're trying to. Yeah, you kind of have to, yeah. isn't it, like the purpose? And it didn't do that. So um, <laughs> It's because they were communicating with horses. Right. It was 19th century communication. And so uh, Yule's attack didn't really kick off until, like I said, until about uh, you know, 7.30, 8, 8 p.m. at night. And it was really uh, one division that he threw. Uh, Major General uh, Edward Johnson, Confederate General, he was basically going to attack uh, the southern end of Culp's Hill. If you did that fish hook thing, it would be down here. How big is Culp's Hill? Like physically? Um, it's pretty decent size. A couple, you know, if you look at it, I guess from a diameter perspective, a couple kilometers. So it's not like a little hill. It's 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 yeah. It's you know, it's decent. It's not like a little nub. Well, I mean, the, some of the like I was looking at what's the, what's the uh, the Devil's Basin or whatever it was. Devil's Den. Devil's Den. It's nothing. It's a small right wedge of land. So yeah, I would say Culp's Hill is roughly the same size as Round Top. Okay. So moving a division through. Yeah. It. Um. So, anyways, uh, General Johnson, the Confederate general, does his attack. Now, what ends up happening is fortunes of war was uh, it almost worked because as Longstreet's attack was going on, uh, the Corps commander, uh, Major General Alpheus Williams, who was act he was an acting Corps commander. It's usually, uh, it was usually General, General Henry Slocum. These are Union generals. The 12th Corps commander, which is who owned that part of the line, Major General Alpheus Williams, was actually sending brigades to support... Um, the Union forces further down the line because of these attacks that Longstreet was doing. And so originally there had been six brigades up on this end. And by the time uh, General Johnson did his attack, there was only one brigade. They pulled out the other five brigades to go south. To, to go handle all the other stuff that was happening. To, to deal with Longstreet's attack. So again, I keep thinking about logistics you know i keep thinking like if they they attack they pull back they attack they pull back they like that's a lot of ammo yeah and i think usually they carried like 60 rounds uh per person uh and so my, mind you these are you know these are muskets front-loaded muskets yeah so and people are dying by the thousands i'm sure they could grab the yeah. sack oh Musket balls. <laughs> Sack of musket balls, yeah. So, uh, Gen and General Johnson's attack happens, and where there should have been several brigades of, of Union forces, there wasn't any brigades there anymore. Uh, luckily, the one brigade that was there uh, was under the command of Brigadier General George Green. He's the Union commander. He was the one brigade commander. Lucky for whom? Lucky for the Union. Okay. Because uh, he was a good general. <laughs> And uh, he had basically ignored his superiors because his superiors like, well, you're going to be moving around a lot. Don't don't dig in. I, I love how you say he was a great general. And then you immediately say, and he ignored his superiors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because he did dig in. He actually built breastworks. And that was 
basically the saving grace. That's how he was able to withstand these attacks. Because when you really look at it, um, it was about 1,500 federal troops going up against about 5,000 Confederate troops. Oh. Right. And so, but because he was... That's more than three to one, or right. one to three, rather. Because he was dug in, he was in entrenchments, he was able to weather uh, that initial that initial attack. Now, he could, you know, you basically had a trench line that had several brigades in it, and then there was only one brigade. What ends up happening is, is that the Confederates do actually capture part of the trench line because there just wasn't enough people to man it. Uh, and so they capture part of this trench line, and then at this point, the attack kind of peters out, okay? Um, it loses, yeah, yeah, loses its momentum, and that's where we're at on the morning. When I say morning, I mean like 3 o'clock in the morning of July 3rd. When's nautical twilight when you can start seeing? You said it's, it's summer, so yeah. obviously it's summer in Pennsylvania, so nautical twilight might even be. It was one hour before, so it would have been, yeah, they said four, around 4 o'clock would have been when the sun started coming up. So, so now we're in day three. So now we're in day three. And so th- th- this is why I kind of wanted to start with Culp's Hill because it basically carries over into the, into the next day. And uh, so the Confederates own some of those trenches and the brigades that were had been sent to re- reinforce long, uh, reinforce Hancock against Longstreet's attack. They bring those brigades back. They never actually get engaged uh of course. So there, one actually gets lost and marches down the wrong road. So this is like the third time this has happened where forces have been going kind of eh, yeah. eh, back and forth, back and forth. So they bring these brigades back, and the plan is we're if the on the Union side, we're going to counterattack and take these back, these trench lines. And the plan on the southern side is we're going to finish what we started the previous day. <laughs> so you actually have both sides – attacking each other, not one side on defense, one side. They're literally like... We're gonna, steal the bacon, get the stuff yeah, in the middle. we're going to attack each other. Now, did you ever play that game in grade school, steal the bacon? No. I, 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 I think Mr. Fisher just made some stuff up because... <laughs> steal the bacon? It, what, what it was, he put a pin, like an exercise pin in the middle of the gym, and you'd have like all the boys on either side of the gym, and you, you'd run at it to capture the bacon, which would be... The pin in the center. The pin in the center. Of the gym. And whoever could get to it first, and there was rules. Like, if you get tagged, you have to drop the right. pin. And Anyway, so two sides are aggressing against one another. So, at this same time, and this is, we'll back up a little bit. You know, around uh, midnight, uh, Jeb Stewart finally shows up. This He's the Confederate Cavalry commander who's been marching, you know, horseback riding around the Union Army. But in doing so, he has denied Lee his eyes and ears. So Lee has no reconnaissance for basically the first two days of the battle. Okay. Jeb Stewart finally shows up, and Lee, of course, is not too pleased. But though Lee's not a screamer, so he basically is like, I was without my eyes and ears. (laughs) (laughs) So you have put me into a bind. And, uh, but they come up with this plan, (laughs) and Lee's plan is I just got. Pickett's division that showed up and they're fresh. They're, there are three brigades, fresh troops. And Lee's like, we got really close, really close. I think if I do it one more time and it's coordinated, better coordinated, uh, we're going to break through the union lines. And this is what he's telling uh, general Longstreet, who is the core commander of general Pickett. Pickett's a division commander. Longstreet's the core commander. And initially, Lieutenant General Longstreet is not warming up to the idea. He's like, uh, well, the Federals want us to attack them because they're on the defense and they have good ground, so maybe we should not Maybe oblige. we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should try to. What's the total force uh, combat power right now? It's, it's, it's like there have been losses for two days now. Uh, Generally speaking, we're looking at. Well. Generally speaking. Oh, generally. We're probably talking. <laughs> The Confederates probably still have probably 50,000, 55,000 still troops that are, you know, potential, you know, potentially. Some tired, uh, some fresh. Available some. for combat. 
Uh, the Federals would have obviously been more than that. We're probably talking 80, 85,000. And they're on the defensive. And they're on the and defensive. they have a good ground. And they have good and ground. And Lee's like, I think we have the day. Well, the thing is, is, but Lee's done that in the past, you know. And so it's not without reason you think, hey, maybe he can do it again. Maybe he can pull a rabbit out of his hat, pull this miracle. Longstreet, like I said, is like, mm, I don't think this is a good idea. So, <laughs> so anyways, that's the plan. He's like, okay, check it out. We're going to do this better than we did last time. I'm going to have General Yule. You're going to send General Johnson, hit the Union in the north at Culp's Hill. And Longstreet, you're going to get ready to attack at first light. Okay. Hopefully, uh, General Johnson's attack at Culp's Hill will draw off Union forces like you know, it could have, it could happen. And so General Johnson still under the orders of, we got to conduct this attack before daybreak. So about an hour before daybreak gets ready to do his attack. But as I mentioned, uh, the union was also going to do attack. Major General Alpheus Williams, the 12th Corps commander was under orders to retake those lost trenches. So he orders one of his division commanders, Major General John Geary, you're going to retake your trenches, okay? And this is all happening. I remind myself and whoever's listening, this is not with night vision. Nope. There's no radio communication. We're not intercepting uh, Confederate radio signals on their frequencies. Nope. This is, I have an idea. <laughs> and someone else is going, I got an idea myself. <laughs> and Is that the northern guy? Yeah. That's Vermont. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so almost simultaneously, they attack at the same time, right around uh, three o'clock in the morning. The Union starts off with a huge cannonade uh, with artillery support. And then Geary steps off with his two brigades, Brigadier General Green's brigade and Brigadier General Thomas Kane's brigade. What are they shooting at? Darkness. Yeah, they can't. I, <laughs> they're that way. <laughs> And well, and then there are instances of, of fratricide, absolutely instances of fratricide in this fight. Man, uh, so it's oh, dark 30. Yep, and they're shooting into the dark, knowing there's enemy in a that, that general, direction. In that general direction, the problem is, as I mentioned, the Confederates are getting ready to attack, and they attack with five brigades, so two brigades against five brigades. This may seem it now. I don't know if there's any data to support this, but wasn't the Union uniformed in dark blue? Yeah, for the most part. And the Confederacy was butternut, uniformed in... Butternut. What's that? Is that the... It's like a mixture of, you know, butternut gray. It's... Oh, like the butternut squash? Yeah, something like that. It's 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 dull. And, but the, I just hypothetically, wouldn't it be easier to see grayish uniforms in moonlight? Uh... I guess, I, you know. I'm just thinking yeah. illumination. And I do believe it was almost a full moon. During like, the if you're trying to look at people in blue uniforms with black hats, and you're trying to fight people in gray uniforms, I think gray is easier to see in moonlight. It's just a thought. I mean, yeah. I've never really thought about it. Yeah. You know, I'd have to, can't really go back in time and be like, hey, what did you see? We're going to have to recreate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's hey, reenactors. I'm sure we can get, you know. Um, Mythbusters to figure it out. Uh, All right, Jamie. So put on this uniform. I'm gonna see. If so, I can shoot anyways, you. Uh, because both forces attack simultaneously, it completely breaks down. Uh, you know, almost immediately, uh, and it becomes a slugfest where they're basically fighting in the trenches. And like I said, this is where you do see instances of fratricide. You know, because it's like I'm, there's a guy in the trench. He looks like a bad guy. You know. Shoot Someone him. with a gun. Yeah. And they, like I said, it basically becomes a slugfest, and it doesn't really come to an end until right about 10 o'clock in the morning. So this is like a seven-hour back-and-forth slugfest. And around 10 o'clock, uh, General Johnson, the Confederate general, orders uh, his two brigade commanders, who had not really been that significantly committed, General Stewart's brigade and uh, General Daniel's brigade, to basically do one last attack, and they hit uh, General Green's right flank, the southern flank. But as they're coming across, the Union's basically got enfilading fire because the Union's already t 
taken part of this, you know, the, this part of the hill, southern part of the hill. So as the Confederates are getting hit from the front and they're getting hit from the sides, and as a result, it, it the, the attack is done within 15 minutes. It's a complete failure. Uh, the Confederates are not able to push the Union forces off of Culp's Hill, and that's that. Now, if you recall... This was supposed to be happening to draw Union forces away from the Union Center where Lee wanted to do the attack. Because they have more forces. Right. It's two to five. Yeah. So this was supposed to be ultimately a feint to draw away Union forces. Okay. Nothing. Nothing Not, happened. Yep. And even worse was, you know, at daybreak, Lee's expecting to hear cannon from Longstreet. He doesn't hear anything. And he's like, what is going on? I presume you have not started the attack. <laughs> and he hadn't. So he was slightly irate that Longstreet had not conducted his attack. And by the way, like I said, that was the whole reason was there supposed to be this simultaneous action. The northern attack by uh, Ewell's Corps was supposed to draw Union forces away from the center. And then Longstreet would attack the center and basically penetrate through. And that didn't So this happen. is just a perfect example of... Terrain, defense, having the massive advantage of you chose the ground, you you choose how to reinforce that ground, and they have overwhelming numbers, but it doesn't win. The overwhelming no. numbers clearly don't win against the defense. So uh, Even though they were attacking each other, right. the Union got that terrain, though. Yeah. Yep. Huh. So, um, so I anyway, have the high ground. So, And the Union did have the high ground, and that's ultimately what made the difference. Uh, in a lot of cases. So at, a, you know, mid morning, you know, 10 o'clock, nine, 10 o'clock, Lee is talking with Longstreet and he's like, we're going to have to change our plan because obviously it didn't go the way we planned. Okay. So that would be a branch. Yes, it would be a branch. Funny enough that you mentioned branch. So he looks across this field that's about a mile wide and he sees a clump of trees and which will hitherto for be known as the angle because there's an angle there in the uh, the stone wall. And he's like, and it's a very pronounced clump of trees. Even when you go there today, you can see there's the horizon's pretty much clear except for this clump of trees. Same clump of trees? Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. And uh, he's like, that's where we're going to direct our attack at. We're going to punch through that point right there. That's where we're going to do the penetration. And so he's like, okay, check it out. I've got Pickett's division, three fresh brigades. All right, I'm going to give you two more divisions, which actually aren't that fresh. Uh, but they hadn't done that much fighting in day two. They had done all their fighting on day one. So, And that would have been uh, Pettigrew and his division and Trimble's division. I remember Pettigrew. Now, Pettigrew, if you remember, he's like, wait, wasn't he a brigade commander? He was. But General Heath was wounded, and so next man up, General Pettigrew is now a division commander. You know, have a division. And uh, General Trimble's was kind of a weird amalgamation. It was uh, two brigades from uh, George Anderson's uh, division and two brigades from uh, General Pender's division. And that's what Trimble commanded. So it was like an ad hoc division force, if you will. And Trimble was kind of like this floating officer that at the time. And so he didn't actually have a command. So it was very easy to kind of plug and play. Like, <laughs> you know, you're now in charge of this. Uh, Isaac Trimble. That was his name. And so these three division commanders are going to conduct this attack, marching across this field about a mile wide. And there's no cover. <laughs> well, it's an open field. You said the the clump of trees was like yeah. the thing that yeah. was obvious. There was a couple. <clears throat> there was a couple of farmhouses, uh, the Kadori farmhouse, but that was that was it. Seems a little dangerous. And in Longstreet, you know, uh, looks at General Lee, and it, you know, and there's a quote. It's in the movie. Uh, it's in his own memoirs. This is Longstreet's memoirs. And he's. And if you see the movie, he actually does this. He says, General, I have been a soldier all my life. I have been with soldiers engaged in fights by couples, squads, companies, regiments, divisions, and armies. 
and should know as well as anyone what soldiers can do. It is my opinion that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. So that's what he supposedly told generally the morning of the attack. <laughs> my advice is uh, no. And, it, and it's probably true. He had, you know, all throughout the battle, he had been arguing that, hey, we should turn the Union flank, hit them from the south, get around the Union flank. Attacking them where they want us to attack them is ultimately Dumb. a recipe for disaster. And uh, Lee's like, I don't care. Uh, you know, we're going to do it. I got 15,000 men. We're going to penetrate the Union line at the clump of trees. And, oh, by the way, before we do that, we're going to line up 150 guns, and we're going to pound the Union line. Okay. Soften up the battlefield. Soften up the battlefield. And so he's like, figure it out. You have your orders. And so that's what happens. General Longstreet, unenthusiastically, but still because he's a professional, you know, puts together uh, puts together this plan. And so between like 11 and 1, a, uh, 1 p.m., it's pretty much quiet on the battlefield. So Culp's Hill ends around 10, 15 a.m. And so between 11 and 1, there's kind of like this calm before the storm. At this point, like at Culp's Hill, is there, are there, there's obviously people dying. Right. But there's also people being wounded. Yep. And there's also potentially people surrendering, being captured. Yep. Yep. There was, yeah, there was definitely, I'm, you know, I, I can actually tell you at the end of the, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union suffered 5,161 missing in action, of which you could probably argue most of those guys were captured. Yeah, because where then, are they? Yeah, and then the Army of Northern Virginia lost <clears throat> 5,846 soldiers missing in action. Similar numbers. Yeah. So, yeah, you are talking... A lot of the... You'll find out, though, a lot of the Confederates that were captured were com captured on July 3rd mm. uh, at Pickett's Charge. They it's were, about to happen. Yeah. So... The in, guy in charge of uh, Longstreet's artillery, he was a young man, actually. He's like, I think he was like 29. Um, Colonel Porter Alexander, he is in charge of Longstreet's artillery. Longstreet's like, hey, I want you to be the person in charge of this massive artillery support mission. And so Colonel Alexander rounds up the guns. Like I said, he ends up collecting about 150 guns of all types, you know, Napoleon's. Parrots, you know, 150 guns. Lots of guns. Lots of guns. And sometime around, they think, because back then no one synchronized their watches or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but it would have been around 1 p.m. was when the bombardment started. The okay. Confederate bombardment. The Confederate bombardment. So 150 guns. <laughs> Insane okay. amounts of smoke. Yes. And like I said, this is not, this is before... Smokeless powder. So almost immediately, uh, it becomes very difficult to try to, you know, adjust your shot, adjust your fire. And so these 150 guns start start blasting. I can imagine that, that literally the sky must have been full. 150 guns, even if you just shot two balls, that's it. Two cannons. Right. Two cannonballs. That's it. It would have been so much smoke. It's already starting to... And it's, yeah, it's, you know, mass hysteria, cats and dogs living together. It's, it's, but because they can't really aim their shots once the smoke comes in, most of those rounds are actually sealing over the head of the Union lines. And mind you, before the barrage begins, painting a picture in my head, is it literally like Lee and his generals and all just this thousands of Confederate soldiers, like, they can see the Union soldiers, like, also doing the same thing. And the Union generals are like, I think they're going to attack us here. And so, yeah, I mean, what they ended up, they would have seen the guns. Uh, the, most of the Confederate soldiers, there was woods. The Confederate soldiers were basically hidden in the woods. So you wouldn't have seen the uh, infantry guys yet. But you would have seen the guns. Getting ready for something. Yeah, getting, you know, rolled up. And you're like, hmm, there's a lot of guns getting But the Union guys, they're behind this wall, essentially. Well, the wall is pretty low. Um, and it's only a part of the line, but that's still a disruptive obstacle right. for infantry. Uh, what's interesting is 
when the bombardment starts, they're not stupid. They lay down, you know, behind the wall. And like I said, most of those rounds sail overhead. They don't actually hit the main Union lines. If you want to be more accurate, they were actually hitting the support zone mm. of the Union forces. So for once, the rear echelon guys were getting it. And uh, <laughs> uh, and they didn't like it at no, all. No, they did not. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the... The forces in the battle zone, the forces in the battle zone were virtually untouched, uh, which if you're the Confederates, that's not what you want to have. It's a very happen. bad thing. Yeah. Uh, Today's even, not a good day for the Confederates. Right. And it's even worse because they're also missing a lot of the Union artillery. Okay. Now, the guy in charge of the Union artillery is a guy by the name of Brigadier General Henry Hunt, and he's the Union artillery chief. This is one of those things that after Chancellorsville, which was the big battle previous to Gettysburg, they brought back like a, think of it like Devardi, but for the entire Union Army. Okay. There's this guy, like each division has its own uh, battalion of artillery, but then there's also like an artillery reserve, and this guy, General Hunt, is in charge of all the artillery. And General Hunt's like, hey, because like you said, he could see the guns coming up, and he's like, oh, yeah. I got a surprise waiting for these guys. Big guns. And so he gets his guns positioned. He starts bringing up his own ammunition. Okay. And he actually orders his gunners not to not to fire back. Because back then, counter battery was not very effective. No, it's um, basically, where's the smoke coming from? Right. It sounds like it came from in that direction. And a deployed artillery piece is actually pretty hard to hit, especially if you're talking over a mile away. And so he actually tells his gunners, don't do it. Don't waste your ammunition. You're not going to be able to hit them. And we're going to, it's better served to have our ammunition be used for big, long lines of infantry, which are a lot easier. Which is clearly about to happen. Yeah, which is a lot easier to hit. And so for the most part, there were actually a couple of guns who had ignored his orders. Uh, but for the most part, the guns were silent. Uh, and what ended up happening was, as these guns went silent the confederate uh officers were like hey maybe maybe our bombardment's working maybe we're getting the union you know, guns yeah maybe the <laughs> artillery is getting knocked out and uh no such luck and that was not the case but that was the you know confirmation bias that was the conclusion that they you know they had plus colonel alexander and you you talk about uh supply had come up into General Longstreet is like, hey, we're running out of, we're running out of artillery shells, and, uh, you know, the last guy sent him too far to the rear. So, you know, by the time we bring more up, you know, the Union lines will have been, you know, reconstituted. So, if you want to do any attack, you should probably do it right around now. Uh, so you have a colonel. Not to say colonels aren't important, but you have a colonel basically recommending to a lieutenant general, hey, you know. Maybe you should start at the attack now. You're going to do something. Yeah. Uh, so, and this is a right around. So, like I said, the bombardment starts around one. It goes around like two hours. So it's That's around, a lot. Right. So around three o'clock is when these three Confederate divisions, Pettigrew, Trimble, and, and Pickett, step off out of that wood line. And now, if you're the Union, you could see these guys come stepping out. Again, I... I have to keep reminding myself of the picture I'm painting in my head. Uh, you said it's a mile. They have to cross a mile. If I'm if I'm wearing sneakers and wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and I've stretched and warmed up, I can run a mile in less than seven minutes at this point. Right. But they're not wearing sneakers on a track. That they're they're literally marching across a field for. 20 minutes? They, they estimate it would have been around 16 to 17 minutes. That's how long it would take them. <laughs> All the while, potentially, right. just waiting for a cannon fire and or... Getting shot. At. <laughs> that is not comfortable no. at all. No. Uh, and so, right around 3 p.m. That's so bad. <laughs> yeah, 3 p.m., uh, they step out, and basically, you've got... It's a two-echelon formation. Ostensibly, it's supposed to be a two-echelon formation with... Pickett in the south, uh, Pettigrew in the north, and then Trimble's guys are behind Pettigrew. Like a two-up, one-back kind yeah, of situation. Yeah, it was a two-up, one-back. But Pettigrew's more behind... I mean, Trimble's more behind Pettigrew than 
and then you know he's not kind of like splitting the difference. Pickett is the main effort because, like I said, he's got even though he only has three brigades, all of his brigades are completely fresh, haven't seen any combat. Uh, under the command of Kemper, Armstead, and Garnett, those are the three brigade commanders. Uh, that was under Pickett's division. And these guys step off, and the movie Gettysburg actually does a pretty good job kind of recreating that scene. And they step off, and by now the guns, of course, have gone silent. Uh, there's a wind, and the wind blows away most of the smoke. And, you know, by this point you can't fire the guns anyways because you didn't really do that much overhead fire. Uh, they march past through the guns. They do that you know, passage of lines as they march through the gun line. And now, like I said, you know, the Union Army can see these They guys. go, and there's our target, and all these thousands 15, of people. 15,000, 15,000 men. Jeez. And mm. they're basically hitting uh, a point on the Union line that's, you know, very, it's a very, like I said, it's not like a big wide point. It's a very specific point. And they're basically hitting, you know, a couple of brigades. Uh, and that's it. Um most of the most of this stuff is going to land on uh, General Alex Webb, Brigadier General Alex Webb, and his brigade. That's where most of this stuff was, you know, concentrated. Uh, Webb fell under uh, would have been Gibbons. Uh, well, actually, would have been Hancock's corps, uh, but Hancock gets injured at this point, uh, so would have been under General Gibbon. Uh, was there any effect of the guns? Like very little. Just negligible not no very little very very little like a guy caught a rock and was like ah, yeah, i mean we're probably talking single digit percentile so nothing yeah uh how much ammo did they waste well two hours worth that's a lot yeah <laughs> it was a lot and Jeez. and so they start marching out they start marching across that field and once they start getting in range, the first thing that starts hitting him is solid shot, okay? Because now uh, General Hunt can open up his artillery. That's and, the bowling balls, right? And he saved all this artillery, and he's like, "This is my, this is my time." Yeah, it's and, a grisly feeling. And oh, by the way, he's not just hitting him from the front because he's got guns on Little Round Top, so he's also hitting him down the line, enfilading fire, Ugh. and and. The Union guys even say, like, these guys look like they're marching in parade. Like, it's with that kind of precision. Uh, you know, they're doing, like, left obliques and right obliques and... And... While under fire. Like, like almost... Like, in the movies, like, when they show the Urukai marching, you hear the... Yeah, it's... it's like, there's... Uh, yeah, it's... Footsteps. Especially before they reach the Emmitsburg Road, they are marching with um, pretty good precision. Jeez. You know... Uh, they even, like I said, they even do like a left oblique as they get closer to the Union lines to redress their lines. Gotta get over here. And, you know, the even Union soldiers even comment like, oh, my God, these guys are actually redressing their lines. Discipline. Un <laughs> under this absolute, you know, maelstrom of hell. And uh, I mean, and, what else are you going to do? Yeah. And they just keep on coming. And, of course, you know, they're in these nice long lines. So a cannonball is going to be taking out like several guys in a shot. Yeah, um, and so they keep on marching. Do you know if there's a number, like an average, like an average effective cannonball took out like oh, seven God. to nine? Oh or, God, I don't know. I'm sure um, someone's done I know, that. Battle like, uh, I know they've looked at like what canister can do. Um, canister is the giant shotgun, right? Yeah, yeah. In, yeah, you're talking like if it's if you got guys coming at you in line formation, probably talking like nine or ten guys. Oh, you know, oh, in, at once. So they get to the uh, Emmitsburg Road, which kind of hits it at an angle. And at this section of the Emmitsburg Road, the section that's closest to the Union lines, the fence is still up. Okay. So now you have another obstacle. Oh, geez. And so you got to climb over this fence. So you're just sitting there and you're getting shredded. Yeah, this is like World War One stuff. Yeah. And once you get across the fence, now you're in range of Union muskets. So you haven't even... Gotten even to the, the rifles yet. <laughs> which Muff, means, muskets, rather. Right, which means you're not shooting either, you know. You're just moving. You're just moving. You're just a bullet catcher at this point. And there was no other way. No other way. This this is the plan. This is the plan. And uh, mm. so they slam in 
to the union line at that clump of trees. They actually do reach uh, the clump of trees. Uh, Pickett's brigades actually do reach it. And then, but in the process, uh, you know, the two of the brigade commanders are wounded and killed. Um, Garnett, uh, Garnett was actually considered missing in action, but it's implied that he was blown apart. Like, you know, I just couldn't even find him. Right. Uh, and the movie actually shows like a cannonball going off and all of a sudden he's gone, you know, <laughs> and you just see his horse just kind of galloping away. Uh, Kemper was wounded in action, uh, was captured by the union and was recaptured by the Confederates. So the only senior commander left was, uh, uh general Armstead who actually knew general Hancock and the movie actually brings this out, you know, Hancock being the union guy and they were buddies before the war. Um, uh, one of the old, yeah. yeah. Can't have a civil war movie without some element of that. Right. So, you know, he crosses over the wall, he takes his hat, sticks it on his sword. And he was like, this is Armstead, uh, you know, charge. And at this angle where the trees are, there's a battery uh, and the battery's under the command of Alonzo Cushing. Okay. Uh, and if you're here at Fort Huachuca, you'll see Cushing Road. This is actually his brother. Uh, and <laughs> The other Cushing. Yeah, the other Cushing. <laughs> and he uh, basically is sitting there with his guns, and he's mortally wounded. This is Alonzo Cushing. And as Armstead's guys come up, he basically blasts them one more time with canister. And, Big shotgun. Right. Significantly uh, disrupts Armstead's advance, and then Alonzo Cushing dies on the guns. Um, reason why I bring that up, he was actually a, uh, awarded the Medal of Honor just a couple of years ago. Oh. Like, you know. Have at the... Yeah. yeah. Uh, his brother was actually killed by Geronimo. <laughs> These guys have a habit of dying in so, war. So, <laughs> uh, here around Fort Huachuca, actually, up, up by the Whetstone, Whetstone Mountains. So... Is there a monument over there? There's a lot of monuments around I don't here. Know. It, that's a good question. Uh, so anyways, this is known as the high watermark of the Confederacy. You know, Armstead has broken the Union lines, supposedly. They're, the Union regiment that was actually at that location, the 71st Pennsylvania, actually breaks. Mm. They fall back. Uh, and it looks like, oh, my God, you know, despite everything, we might actually have a success here. But it's short-lived. Uh, but it is not to be so. Because most of the other Union units do not break and run. And then what ends up happening is, as the Confederate soldiers kind of pour into this very small, salient bulge, if you will, they're now getting hit from... You're almost enveloping yourself. Right, they're getting hit from all sides. Uh, the 69th Pennsylvania kind of refuses their flank and starts shooting into uh, the Confederate forces. The 71st Pennsylvania the ones who ran, they were able to reform and they start shooting back. Uh, and then the 42nd New York and the 19th Massachusetts, they counterattack into the Confederate. See, this is why we require 18 to one combat power overmatch for yeah. a penetration. Uh, and it's not going any better with the Northern attack. So Pickett's division was in the South. Pettigrew's was in the North. Uh, he runs into uh, general Hayes's division and Hayes, sends two of his regiments out. It's kind of weird when you go actually see the monuments because you're like, why are those Union regiments way out there? Uh, it would have been the 8th Ohio and the 126 New York. And why that's important is because what they end up getting is because they're out, they end up getting enfilading fire as the Confederates are going this way. The Union's hitting them from here and here. And It's a slaughterhouse. It, and it is. <laughs> uh that seems... Uh, I'm going to see if I can put these maps up on the YouTube yep. screen. By 4 p.m., it's over with. So they step out at 3 p.m. By 4 p.m., it's done. Uh, and the Confederates have lost. Um, you want to talk about a breakdown of command and control. So Pickett, he survives. Uh, he had actually gotten... He had set up his division headquarters by the Kadori Farm which is right along Emmitsburg Road. But he loses all three brigade, all three brigade commanders. Okay. Mm. Uh, Garnett and Armstead are killed in action. They have been disintegrated. Yeah. Kemper was wounded in action. 
14 out of his 15 regimental commanders are either dead or wounded in action. So he's got one co you know, regimental commander that's... How much is the whole force degraded at that point? Like a lot. I'm assuming yeah. they're getting slaughtered. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. He, his division suffered, um, I think, like over... Like division, like suffered over like 40, 50% casualties. <laughs> um, and that's why in the movie, and he said it in real life, like... You know, when General Lee tells him to reform his division, General Pickett's like, General Lee, I have no division. <laughs> so, uh, and that's that. Uh, the attack fails. Uh, the Confederate forces, in not in any kind of order, start to kind of stream back uh, in little clumps, groups. And Lee's thinking that General Meade's going to, like, counterattack. You know, he's like, we are completely disheveled. I mean, it's a good suggestion. Right. Uh, disorganized. The reality of it is, and some of the, it, Lincoln thought so too, by the way. And Lincoln was like, well, why didn't you do that? Uh, but there's a lot of schools of thought and a lot of scholarship. It was like, Meade was just as disorganized as Lee was. Um, and the idea that he could just pick up his units and conduct a counterattack was probably a bridge too far. Uh, so, yeah, you'll say the counterattack doesn't happen. Also, we don't have UASs flying overhead no, and no, looking at stuff. No. And So, and as the Confederates are streaming back, the Union uh, soldiers start screaming, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg. And that's kind of like in your face, you know, because the yeah, Confederate... Fredericksburg, they got... Yeah, the Confederates... Confederates slaughtered the, the Union. Union. And now it's like... Get wrecked. <laughs> yeah. How does it feel now, you know? Uh and it is a, for the first time, it's really, truly a, a significant lopsided victory against the vaunted General Robert E. Lee. Like, yes, you have clearly lost this battle. And by extension, a huge portion of your army. Yep. Yep. I mean, like I said, he, you know, you're literally talking. You know, 13, when you, when you add it all up. Probably like thirteen thousand casualties uh, for killed, missing in action, and wounded in action of an army that was, you know, about seventy five thousand. So twenty percent. Yeah, twenty percent overall, and that's not counting just battle fatigue. You know, right. you might still have all your limbs, and but you're exhausted. Also, didn't you say one of the purposes of this Confederate incursion into Northern Territory was also for supplies? Yeah, they actually did get supplies, uh, you know. <laughs> nice. Yeah, uh, they did. Uh, Stewart actually brought like 100 wagon loads. Um, Jeb Stewart did. Uh, they did actually capture some supplies. But the problem is, is like, it, you know, it really wasn't worth the cost. You've lost, and this is the Civil War. So when, unlike today, when a guy gets wounded, there's a strong chance he's going to be returned to duty. <laughs> this is the Civil War. A no. guy gets wounded, he's probably still going to die. First of all, yeah. yeah. And second of all, he's not going to be able to fight yeah. even if he does. Uh, and so you have that problem. And so you have, you've lost a significant portion of your force. You've lost a lot of commanders, you know, uh, a lot of officers, a lot of good commanders. And, you know, that's going to be hard to replace. Now, this is, this is still what some people call the uh, gentlemanly warfare. So when the field is lost by the Confederates or, or won by the uh, Union, however you look at it, there's an element of let them retire the field and let them go lose, and then they just pack up their crap and go? No, there was or, definitely... Um, there was definitely... Lee was like, okay, uh, at some point, Meade's going to come after me. So he needs to withdraw under and pressure so, almost. Almost. And so July 4th, it's raining... And as they say, it, the rain, you know, washed away the blood of the battlefield. Um, mm. and, oh, it's still there. <laughs> um, but he doesn't, he starts to get ready to pull back. And Lee starts to pull back on July the 5th. And it's one of those kind of things where he's got to send his wagon train, you know, one particular direction. And he wants to have his forces between his wagon train and the Union Army. Because uh, his wagon train is his supplies. <laughs> With them supplies. As well as... Thousands of wounded, you know, that he wants to bring back to, uh, you know, Virginia. And so now it is kind of like a, it's a pursuit on the case of Meade. 
and then it's a withdrawal on the case of Lee. And it's the the idea at that point. And it takes basically 10 days from July 5th to 14 July for the Confederate Army to get back to and across the Potomac River. And like the Potomac River is kind of like once we get across the Potomac, we're, you know, we're safe. Relatively. And and like I said, it was one of those things that Lincoln was not happy with me. He's like, you just beat him significantly you have a chance to finish him off still have superior numbers probably superior ammo yep and you didn't do it and that that kind of stuck in lincoln's craw uh and you know lincoln was not happy with it like i said there's a lot of schools of thought that could have me to have you know actually beaten lee well, it's like armchair coaching right you know you watch the game with 15 cameras overhead of the field and you're like oh didn't you see yeah he was right he was wide open you know you're not looking from the perspective of the giant linebacker who's blocking the view right and and lee would have been on the defense this time which you know the converts do very well on that <laughs> and so uh and at you know once they get down to uh williamsport which is where they cross the potomac lee actually sets up a pretty strong defense and me takes one good look at that. And he's like, yeah. Maybe not. We're not going to, you know. And he actually even talks to his generals. And they're like, yeah, that's not probably going to happen. You're probably not going to be able to penetrate, you know, the lines there. And that's pretty much, you know, and like I said, July 14th, the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia crosses back into Virginia. And that's the end of the Gettysburg campaign. Now, What's also going on, by the way, at this exact same time, we have to stress this, is that the siege at Vicksburg ends. So um, General Pemberton surrenders to General U.S. Grant on July 4th. Mm. How many major conflicts are happening at this exact moment? In, major. Con those two. Well, and those are big. Yeah, they're um, big. Uh, and one could argue that Vicksburg was actually more important. Um, uh, <laughs> because when Vicksburg falls, the Union now has complete control of the Mississippi River. From because like, remember when we were talking about Agincourt, and I was like, "What what other battles were happening? Like, none." It was like, yeah. "There's this army, and there's that army." Yeah, and that's that's a hallmark of modern warfare: is armies get larger, and there's more, you know ground because the armies are larger you're going to start to see where it's like there's fighting over here and there's fighting over here and it's not just necessarily in one so there were so there was gettysburg there right. was vicksburg was there any other thing that was like oh and then there were thirty thousand people over here uh, i mean you had stuff going on in um the trans mississippi so you know across in arkansas and texas but nothing significantly large um certainly not on the same scale as gettysburg and, and vicksburg but i mean you still are talking the two chief armies in the East and the West, and in the case of, uh, you know, the Confederates at, at, at Vicksburg, that entire force that was at Vicksburg surrendered, you know. So you're talking, I think, like upwards of 30,000 soldiers. <laughs> That's a lot of... And, and the North and the South are using th the same stuff, right? Like, if... 30,000 soldiers surrender, you can grab the, their sacks o musket balls and use them, yes? Uh, potentially. Um, it, you know, it, certainly the Union had more uniform um, ammo requirements, but they weren't still completely uniform. Like you had, uh, there was a unit in the Union Army uh, that the guy, the commander... Um, had armed all his guys with repeating rifles, and he even equipped them with their own ammo. <laughs> um, but that's not, I mean, nowadays, NATO forces use right, five, 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 six. Five, six it's, yeah. it's just, that's just, um, it is what it is. But yeah, the, 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 in terms of supply, the Union was definitely better off. Uh, for instance, Confederate artillery rounds were notoriously uh, badly made, and so they either didn't detonate or they detonated prematurely. So uh, it's fun. And that was something that, you know, um, bedeviled the Confederates throughout, you know, the entire war. And that just goes back to the fact that 
they didn't have a lot of industry that, you know. Ah, uh, yes. I remember reading about that in uh, eighth grade, you talking know. about the industry versus the agriculture. And whereas the union did. And so there was, you know, a lot more places where you could make cannon, provide ammunition for cannon, as well as, you know, build muskets and what have you. Uh, so, and, and like I said, a lot of times when the Confederates got like the new weapons, it was because they stole them. <laughs> you know, they got them from the Union guys. Good point. Uh, oh, hey, you got repeating rifles. This is awesome. Yeah, now we do too. Uh, and you know, and and that eventually, like I said, you know, when it becomes a war of resources, that was just another knock. At, you know, uh, on the Confederates because they're not going to win that. They just don't have the same amount of resources that the Union had. Uh, you know, when the Union. When the North, at the end of the Civil War, the North economically took off, you know. Yeah, they, was, they still had all the stuff. Right. And, and there hadn't been a lot of They weren't of devastated right. by. And the South had been completely wrecked. And uh, and then you take away their slaves. Right. And so, and then, you know, it took the better part of several decades for you know, the South to recover. Meanwhile, the North is. And some people still say the South still hasn't recovered. Right. Like in 2023, there's still elements of just hasn't recovered. So Gettysburg though, Gettysburg is over. Yep. Gettysburg is over. It is, it is the turning point, whether, whether Vicksburg is, is also there. It's that this date and time group is still like now it's, it's over. It's the decisive point of the entire civil war. And yet they fought for another, you know, better part of a year and a half, which uh, there's a lot of schools of thought that say, hey, you know, if they had cut their losses. How much of that is because, like, so if that happened to, in today's era and such a decisive shift happened, it, it might be like, ah, all right, we're done. Yeah. Right. But there's no mass communication. There's telegraphs and they can right. send stuff. Right. But it's not mass communication to the people that comprise the armies. There's no, you know, they're still doing hear ye, hear ye stuff. Well, I mean, it's certainly better than what it was, you know, as, as easy as 20 years prior to that because of the telegraph. Now you're getting uh, updates by the day. Yeah, real-time updates, right. but you, you're still recruiting right. people to fill those soldiers, those, those, those armies and divisions from the population who thinks right. there's still a fight going on. And I don't think they are saying, hear ye, hear ye, we got schwacked hardcore and we're losing. Would you like to join? I, I, well, you know, interestingly enough, they would have published the casualties right in the papers. So you'd be like, you'd find out from Billy Game, oh my God, I lost my husband. <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, and, or I lost my dad, or I lost my husband and my dad and my brother. Uh, wah, wah, wah. So... Oh, wait. So sad. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But, I mean, you know, at that point in the war, the Union hadn't really, other than Nashville and New Orleans, hadn't really taken any significant portion of Confederate terrain. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, the common people who are also, you know, feeding soldiers, they're not looking at it from a military tactical standpoint. Nowadays, as uneducated as people are, we, we still have a general, because of mass communication, news, informative interviews, podcasts. Uh, the common person will be like, oh, I have a much greater understanding of the geopolitical military impact of this battle right. versus the common people of the it, 1860s, yeah, maybe. It's, it's possible. Um, I mean, if you read like the diaries, one thing about that time, people wrote a lot more. Well, yeah, that was the... Um, they didn't have Facebook to keep their right. memories. <laughs> or TikTok. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of diaries and letters that kind of give you that, you know, whatever perception you're looking for. Uh, but like I said, you know, had the war ended there, the, the dest- most of the destruction that was wrought on the South happened after Gettysburg. Partially because the Union could now do it. Right. Yeah. It was like- uh, and, you know, pretty much, obviously, from 1864 onward, it was most of the fighting happened, well, all the, nearly all the fighting happened in the South, and it was in the Deep South. It wasn't just on the periphery like it had been. It's like Mississippi. You know, throughout some, you know, throughout the first couple of years of the war. Now you're... South Carolina. Now you're getting into Atlanta. Georgia. Yeah, now you're getting into, you know, 
the Carolinas and and all the destruction that came with it. Um, and that could have been avoided if they'd just been like, yeah, I think we lost. All right, so final thoughts, Battle of Gettysburg. Final thoughts. Uh, Lee bit off a lot more than he could chew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he overestimated... Uh, he overestimated his own forces, and he completely underestimated the Union forces. And if you take it from the perspective, you know, this is post-Chancellorsville, where he actually did defeat a Union army twice his size, you can kind of see where that hubris came from. Hubris, good one. Yeah, but the reality of it was is, and history has shown this, defeat is a better teacher than victory. Yes. And so the Union army... Learn from their defeats at chances, really. They're like, yeah, we're not going to do that again. And um, and in almost every perspective during that battle, the Union did better, you know, in terms of command and control, in terms of maneuver. They, they, they just outfought them. Economy um, of force. And uh, unified command. Well, I mean, they had, yeah, both guys had. I'm been, just thinking of all the principles yeah, of war. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, they just, in terms of how they maneuvered their forces, they certainly had better intelligence, absolutely had better intelligence than, than the Confederates had. And like I said, that was because Jeb Stuart was kind of riding around the Union Army doing his thing, whereas, and thereby denying Lee his eyes and ears, uh, whereas the Union Army was like, I know exactly where all the Confederate units are. They're here, 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 and here. And, oh, by the way, you know, Pickett's division hasn't showed up, so if there's going to be another attack, it's probably going to be his division because... Yep. Assessing just, oh, this right. is obvious. And Lee did not have... They also any, had the high ground like three right. times. And Lee had no idea, didn't have anywhere near that level of fidelity when it came to the Union forces, especially on the early, on the first and second day where it was like, I know where that core is, but I don't know where the other core is. Could be behind them, could be south of me, could be, I don't know. Every time I hear about the Civil War or any um, black powder era stuff, I just... I'm just once again reminded how nice it is to live today. Yes. It's just everything. Like, even as easy, even as being in the military, it's just better to be in the military today. Oh, yeah. Like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you're going to die, you're going to die. Like, if you get schwacked in, in a fight today, generally speaking, you are deleted immediately. Or, nice. if you're not. <laughs> what is this, like, Tron? <laughs> yeah, like, well, it is. Like, if. Or if you're not, there's a pretty good chance you're going to live and and be able to continue life right. and continue your story. Nothing good about that era in war makes me feel at all like, boy, war back then, mm, that, that's how you're supposed to fight. Like, yeah. nothing. Um, if we have to use violence to solve disputes, I'd much rather be alive today. That, that's my takeaway from Gettysburg okay. is I'm glad I'm not there. Sounds good. All right. Signing <laughs> off. Take it easy.